You are listening to We Saw the Devil, an investigative and conversational true crime podcast that deep dives into fascinating criminal cases that are solved, unsolved, or ongoing. From America's Lori Vallow to Jeremy's Armin Mivas, we examine and discuss the world's most shocking cases. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to follow us online. Check us out at WeSawTheDevil.com and we saw the Devil on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can become part of the show by backing us on Patreon. Hello, everyone. You are listening to We Saw the Devil. I'm your host, Robin, and I'm going to be honest. Today's episode was originally going to be a news update on a handful of cases that I've been covering. Eliza Fletcher, Lori Vallow, and then that random mass shooting on Wednesday that also took place in Memphis. But now it's not. I've been really angry and upset since Eliza Fletcher's story hit the news for a handful of reasons. Like so many other women, I'm beyond exhausted. I'm tired of seeing women disappear at the hands of their partners, dragged off the street and kidnapped by a complete stranger, raped by a fellow student, friend, or blind date from a dating site, assaulted. I myself am exhausted with having to mentally check off a number of safety protocols before I perform a simple everyday task, you know, that men can do without a second thought. And I'm also tired of being told to carry a gun as if A, that should even be a freaking requirement to a woman's existence to begin with. And B, I don't think a gun would have helped Sydney Sutherland, who was struck from behind by her rapist slash murderer's truck and killed. I'm just so tired of hearing it all. The day after Eliza Fletcher was found, yet another predator attempted to kidnap a jogger in Knoxville, Tennessee, tried to drive up and pull her off of the, the, the street, the running path. Luckily, she was able to get away. While Eliza was still missing, the Memphis Police Department also announced that there were four young black girls who went missing in 48 hours. Four children under the age of 15. Did any of you hear about that? Because I'm betting you didn't. They got a couple tweets each and then some online BIPOC accounts posted and shared their missing posters. Eliza Fletcher quite literally captured all headlines and interests. And I can understand why. It's not every single day that a woman is completely pulled off of the street in such a public manner. As everyone knows, and as we discussed in a previous episode, she was she's known as, quote unquote, the billionaire heiress. So obviously there's going to be elevated coverage of her case in the media. But as I was scrolling through Eliza Fletcher updates on Twitter, I came across the case that I'm covering today in this episode, and it absolutely gutted me. I saw her picture on a missing persons ad, and she's sitting on the ground in kind of a fall photo shoot type of uh, photo. A pile of dried leaves kind of surrounds her, falling in the picture, and she has the brightest, most infectious smile I've ever seen in my life. And immediately, I had to know what happened to her. So I've been reading every document and watching every single interview that I can find, which admittedly, there aren't very many because this case just hasn't gotten the visibility that it and so many others deserve. And the more I read about this case that I'm covering today, the angrier I got. Because I mean, fucking irate, actually. I even reached out to the family offering to help in any way that I can to increase the visibility of this case. And guys, you may not know it. But a lot of us podcast hosts from different true crime podcasts that you may listen to, a lot of us actually talk. We have some some groups and whatnot that we all you know talk in private groups. We share feedback with one another, help, frustrations. We celebrate our successes together. And one frustration that's consistently shared is how people of color are underrepresented in not only in news and media coverage. I mean, that's a given, but also in the true crime podcast arena itself. And this may be a difficult conversation, but I really need you guys, you listeners, to hear what I'm saying and at least keep your heart and minds open. Speaking solely for myself, I've tried to approach this subject in previous social media posts or episodes here on We Saw the Devil. You know what happens? It it actually results in one-star Apple reviews of how I'm pandering or creating divisiveness or nasty racist emails. And the thing is, guys, my experience isn't unique. All of my true crime podcast host friends, they've all experienced this as well, and we actively discuss it on a weekly basis. Missing white woman syndrome, 
is a phrase that was coined by late journalist Gwen Eiffel at a 2004 journalism conference in response to commentary by CNN anchor Suzanne Malvo. Malvo made the comment, quote, In 1994, during Rwanda, we were looking at Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding. Gwen Eiffel then interjected and referring to the newsroom management said, quote, If it's a missing white woman, you're going to cover that every day. And when Gwen Eiffel said that, the room absolutely exploded in applause. And for just a little additional context, for those of you unaware, the Rwandan genocide happened when over 100 days in 1994, longer period of time, but this was the worst, over 100 days in 1994, a million Tutsi and moderate Hutus were murdered by the ethnic majority, the Hutu. A million people were tortured and killed in 100 days, literally just over three months. Hundreds of thousands of women on both sides were raped. More than 800,000 people were killed in mid-May of 1994 alone. 800,000 people in just a matter of like a week or two. And yet, two figure skaters received more coverage than a million genocide victims and survivors. And in my lifetime, I've never seen a worldwide obsession with a missing persons case like we did with Gabby Petito. And I won't rehash that one. I mean, you all know what happened. I covered it heavily myself on this podcast because I think most women really related to her situation. I know I did. And I'm not saying it should not have been covered. Visibility is always a good thing for any criminal case or missing person. In fact, I wish every single one could be covered. The more eyes on, the better. But the fact of the matter is that the media should cover the Black women, Latina women, Indigenous women, and other women of color who go missing. In reality, in statistics, women of color do not get the same amount of media interest, if any at all. Per the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, multiracial women are 33.5% of reported rapes. Native women, 26.9%, Black women, 22%, Hispanic, 14.6%, and white women, 18.8%. The disparity is real in terms of violence, whether it's intimate partner violence, homicide, rape, domestic violence, and also media coverage. Black Americans constitute 13% of the U.S. population, yet 31% of missing persons. 54% of missing persons are white but they make up 76% of the population. Black, Latina, Indigenous women are much more likely to be victims of rape, domestic violence, and homicide, like I said. Yet we rarely see them plastered on every single news channel with 24-7 coverage like we have in other cases. And some of the other cases that have been recognized as quote-unquote missing white women syndrome, we have cases like Elizabeth Short, J.C. Uh, Duggard, Polly Class, John Benet Ramsey, Chandra Levy, Elizabeth Smart, Holly Wells, Lacey Peterson, Jessica Lynch, Kaylee Anthony, Madeline McCann, Holly Bobo, Molly Tibbetts, Jamie Kloss, and most recently, Gabby Petito. And not only that, And it might not be something that you're cognizant of because it's not something that we really think about. But the laws that are made after missing persons cases, the ones named after them, they're all named after white women. We have Lacey and Connor's law named after Lacey Peterson, Amber Alert laws after Amber Hagerman, Jessica's law after Jessica Lunsford, Kaylee's law for Kaylee Anthony, Megan's law, Drew's law, Lori's law. Kristen's Act, and then Skyler's Law after Skyler Niece. Regardless of your political party affiliation, I think that we can all agree that the media is out for clicks, views, and money. They follow the money. They sensationalize these stories where and when they can in order to get the highest revenue possible. That's just sadly how it works. And I don't think a single person listening right now, I don't think any of you, feel that a victim's race should determine how newsroom managers assign coverage. But it does. And unfortunately, there are far-reaching consequences on that. Do you think any of the four kidnapped children from Memphis received a fraction of the police and law enforcement resources that Eliza Fletcher did? What do you think would have happened in the insanely suspicious Tamla Horsford case out of Georgia if news stations had flown in 20 reporters, posted 24-7 coverage, followed local law enforcement around, and camped outside her friend's home where she died? Would there have been a different outcome? Would they have tried a little bit harder 
and gone down the straight and narrow to pull the evidence and be more transparent about it. I'm just going to go ahead, go out on a limb and say that I think there could have possibly been a different outcome in that case based on what we know so far. Instead, that case was just a light blip on the radar and then nothing. Her family still continues to fight for justice. The fact of the matter is that these large cases, the ones that receive all of the media coverage, receive a disproportionate amount of government resources because investigators are pressured into solving the highest profile cases. This is an issue that can quite literally determine whether a case gets solved. And being born into a skin that is not white should not be the determining factor of whether your murder, your kidnapping, your assault receives law enforcement resources. It just shouldn't be. But yet it is. And I'd like to say just one more thing. Earlier I mentioned how a lot of your favorite true crime podcasters, how we all talk to one another. And one of the constant topics is the fact that, guys, when we publish episodes on people of color, where the victims are people of color, those episodes tend to perform without without fail 30 to 60% more poorly on average than those featuring white victims. Those episodes receive 30 to 60% fewer downloads than episodes that feature victims who are white. And we talk about this a lot. It's disgusting. It's horrifying. It's embarrassing. But it's true. This is a known phenomenon. And we're constantly talking about how to tackle the disparity because this is an issue that is so deeply entrenched in the criminal justice system. I mean, hell, it's not even just that. It's all connected. Media, journalism, education, mental health, social services, criminal justice, and more. It's so heavily interconnected. And this is all definitely a full conversation for another episode and another day, but I just wanted people to be aware that this effect is actually played out in true crime podcasts as well. And it hurts my heart every single time I put out an episode on a case that needs needs the visibility, needs to get out there, and it doesn't receive half the downloads. And then other podcast hosts that I know are like, yeah, same with my, you know, same with mine. It's just really sad. And this is not to take anything away from Eliza Fletcher and what she horrifically endured. And all of my love went out to all of the people across the country today who went to run in support of Eliza Fletcher quote unquote, finishing her run because it continues the conversation. I don't know if any of you guys saw the post that I made on our uh, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok about all of the different things that women can't do. I mean, basically, we're not allowed to exist without the threat of violence. I feel like any time a conversation is ignited out of tragedy, hopefully, you know, something can come of that. Something can. So That being said, I will be covering the last of the Eliza Fletcher case uh, because I really do want to cover everything that's happened in that so far as well. But for this episode, we're covering a nursing student who has gone missing, and it's all but confirmed that her boyfriend murdered her. So why hasn't he been charged in her death? I'm going to introduce you to the case of Irene Gakwa. But how has everyone been? I hope you guys are practicing, you know, appropriate self-care and doing things that make you happy and also staying hydrated. It's been a hell of a week on the news front, especially. And even though the internet is arguably one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century, I just feel like some weeks, the news cycle, because we have such constant access to news these days, I mean, instantaneous, really. God, Google Maps, you know, even if there's an active shooting, it pops up on Google Maps if it's in your city. It's just absolutely wild. I feel like constant exposure to news can be emotionally draining and impactful to our mental health. And it seems that the last couple of weeks have been extra fruitful on that end. So I hope all of you guys are taking, taking good care. So before we get started, let's just get our quick housekeeping out of the way. You're listening to We Saw the Devil. I'm Robin. You can find our website at wesawthedevil.com. And from there, you can find all of our socials, the Patreon, as well as send a message if you have any concerns, compliments, case requests, questions, or complaints. And most importantly, if you're enjoying the content on this podcast, please take 30 seconds out of your day to leave a five-star review on whatever platform you're using to listen. It means the world to us content creators, and it actually has a lot to do with things like sponsorships, uh, guest opportunities, and exposure. So if you want more and better content, leaving a five-star review helps with that. Alrighty, that's enough of that. Let's start from the ground up and cover this case. 
If you follow us on any of our social media accounts, you likely saw the missing persons post I made about her yesterday. Irene Gakwa's smile was positively infectious. Born and raised in Nairobi, Kenya to parents Francis and Joyce Gakwa, Irene is the youngest of three children. Her oldest brother is Kennedy, and brother Chris is the middle child. Both Kennedy and Chris had actually already immigrated to the U.S. in previous years, settling in the Boise, Idaho suburb of Meridian. They both married, settled down, and made lives for themselves. The Gakwa children had always been incredibly close, and Irene really missed her brother, so she decided to come to the U.S. to join them and also pursue her dream of becoming a nurse. The entire Gakwa family was close for that matter. I mean, really, really close. All three siblings would have WhatsApp calls with their parents every day or almost every other day. Francis and Joyce were particularly anxious about Irene's move to a country more than 9,000 miles away. Irene Gakwa was just five feet tall and barely even weighed 90 pounds. She was very, very, very small. Not only that, she was incredibly shy and introverted. When she lived in Nairobi, she would rarely actually leave the house due to her anxiety and shyness. Her father was quoted as saying, quote, We sometimes had to remind her to get out of the house and get some sunlight. But again, the Gakwa siblings were especially close. So the fact that Irene was going to move in with her younger brother Chris and his wife, Joyce, tampered a lot of her parents' fears. Irene made it to the U.S. in May of 2019 and moved in with Chris and Joyce, and she would actually help babysit their kids while they were at work, but she also got a job in a group home taking care of its elderly residents. Having taken care of her own older parents, Irene's incredible patience and love for the residents was evident to all. Irene ended up meeting 38-year-old Nathan Heitman on Craigslist and had a somewhat secretive relationship with him for quite a while. In 2020, she and her sister-in-law, Joyce, went on a girl's trip to Los Angeles. The two had become basically inseparable best friends, and Irene confided in her about her relationship with Heitman. But she asked her not to tell her brothers or anyone else. After dating for a period of time, Irene moved with him into his Meridian home. Despite Irene living with Heitman, she never gave her brothers and parents many details about him or their relationship. In fact, any. They had no idea. As she was a fairly private and independent person, they didn't really question it, especially when she began going to school at the College of Western Idaho. They eventually found out about him, and they knew that she and Nathan had broken up and gotten back together multiple times, but they thought that their relationship had ended. In the summer of 2021, Nathan and Irene moved together to Gillette, Wyoming, where Nathan purchased a home. Irene transferred her studies to Gillette College and continued pursuing her dream of nursing. She would video chat with her parents via WhatsApp every single day without fail and texted her siblings and sister-in-law back in Idaho daily as well. She returned to visit them in Meridian multiple times, with the last visit being Thanksgiving of 2021. Since Irene and all of her siblings were planning to go to Kenya for Christmas to visit their parents, it was just a Thanksgiving for the siblings alone. They cooked African dishes that their mother used to make, like rice, cabbage and tomatoes, ugali, and barbecued goat. After they ate dinner, they video chatted with their parents, and then Irene returned to Gillette. That was the last time that her siblings saw her in person. Irene continued to maintain close contact with her family until the end of February. On February 24th of this year, Irene had a WhatsApp video call with her parents. They noticed that she appeared much skinnier than usual. She looked tired, and her hair, which was usually braided, was straight, unkempt, and disheveled. She did not look well, and that was the last time her parents spoke to her. Her parents attempted to contact her on WhatsApp multiple more times, but the chat request went unanswered. Instead, they received texts in response, texts that were completely unlike Irene's normal writing pattern. Irene usually wrote in a mixture of Swahili and Kenyan slang, and the recent text messages were in very, very disjointed English. Her oldest brother said that it was almost like someone was using Google Translate to send them, like reverse translate to send them. Between February 26th and the first week of March, Irene's family received text messages from her phone, most of them basically being excuses for why she couldn't video chat. One of the messages said, Dad, I dropped my phone in the water and now the microphone doesn't work. Another said, I just want you to know that I love you and miss you, Mom. Her father replied to this message saying, We miss you. We want to see you, not just chat on WhatsApp. We love you always. 
you will be my daughter forever. Growing increasingly worried that they couldn't get in touch with her, her brothers actually decided to go through Irene's call records because her phone was part of their family plan. They found a close friend of Irene's that she spoke to frequently and gave them a call. That's when they discovered that Irene had moved with Nathan Heitman, that they'd gotten back together and moved to Gillette, Wyoming together. They didn't even know that they had rekindled their relationship again. So on March 20th, her brothers reported her missing officially to the Gillette Police Department. The department dispatched an officer to talk to Nathan Heitman that very same day. Nathan claimed that he had seen Irene in late February when she came home one evening, packed all of her clothes in two plastic bags, and then left getting into a dark SUV before driving off. He said he hadn't heard from her since. He did admit, however, to withdrawing all of her money from her account, but he told police officers that this was to force her to contact him because she would inevitably need money and that he was desperate for her to come back. Irene's documentation, like her passport, her IDs, and other personal effects were still, in, were still in Nate Heitman's possession. Irene's family sent many requests for him to give them her belongings. She's missing. She has not been seen. Can you please give us, you know, some of her personal effects, her photos, her driver's license, her student ID? Can you please give us her personal effects? He refused to give them to her family. By April 12th, Nathan Heitman was under investigation as a person of interest in the disappearance of Irene Gakwa, and police uncovered a lot of disturbing activity. The department issued a public statement naming Heitman a person of interest in the case and said, quote, he has not made himself available to detectives looking to resolve questions that exist in this investigation. They found that between the end of February to the middle of March, Nate Heitman had transferred $3,700 from Gakwa's bank account to his own and then also spent an additional $3,200 on her credit card. Her WhatsApp was deleted, her Gmail email address had also been deleted, and her phone number had also been deleted after it was last active on March 4th. On April 24th, Irene's family created the website whereisirene.com and her brothers traveled to Gillette to put up missing persons flyers. Again, Nathan Heitman still refusing to return Irene Gokwa's belongings to her family, even though they've traveled to Gillette, begging for them. And to the credit of the people in Gillette, Wyoming, many of them have actually rallied together to help. They've organized search parties that canvass neighborhoods. They've collectively hung missing persons flyers. They've gone door to door seeking information. One of the largest groups printed out t-shirts that say, where's Irene? And they wear them in public every time they go out. So this case gains visibility. And to this day here, we're in early September, almost mid-September, you will still see flyers with Irene's face posted around the town. On Tuesday, May 10th, the Gillette Police Department arrested Nathan Heitman. He was charged with two felony counts of theft, one felony count of unlawful use of a credit card, and two felony counts of crimes against intellectual property. That's it. Heitman has pleaded not guilty to all charges, and he was actually released on a $10,000 bond. His pretrial conference is scheduled for November, so we actually have about a month and a half before his uh, pretrial conference is scheduled. And you can bet your ass that I'm going to be covering this rapidly. Now, guys, here's the thing. As police investigated him as a person of interest in this case, it came to light that on February 24th, the same day as that last WhatsApp call to, that Irene had with her parents, Nate Heitman was seen in Walmart buying new pair of boots, a shovel, and a 55-gallon drum. Again, the day that Irene went missing forever, he was caught buying a new pair of boots, a shovel, and a 55-gallon drum drum. I think that most of us know what that likely means. And not only did Nate Heitman buy this drum, but he bought the drum and was seen by his neighbors burning it the very next day. He had a fire in this drum the very next day on February 25th. He bought all these items. He's being completely non-responsive to the police op- to the police department. They have called him completely uncooperative. He's refusing to help, refusing to speak. And they've only arrested him for the financial crimes pieces of this. They've served multiple search warrants of his of his home. I'm not sure. I don't think they've done anything with his uh, property, the grounds around his home, though. I've seen people arrested and charged with murder on a whole hell of a lot less. And this man, this walking thumb, he knows something. 
he's out right now. He's he's home and chilling. And I'm just so absolutely appalled by this. And as people who follow true crime, we all have those cases that pull at our heartstrings. You know what I mean? We all have those cases. For a lot of you, I know a lot of you, it's uh, Lori Vallow um, with JJ and Tylee. You know, they in particular pull at your soul and you follow that case rapidly because of it. When I came across Irene's picture and just saw this beautiful, innocent, sweet person who not only disappeared, but we now have proof that her boyfriend purchased boots, a shovel, and a drum. Like, I don't know how many of you guys have seen the movie Megan is Missing, but that's what I envision and I just want to vomit. So I am actively begging. I am imploring all of you to share everything you can about this case. The website is whereisirene.com. There are multiple resources there as well. There is a reward for more information uh, leading to an arrest in the case. The phone number to the Gillette Police Department, National Missing and Unidentified Person System, as well as a timeline. Irene was 32 years old. She's five foot one, 89 pounds, black with black hair and brown eyes. You can also, if you're interested, uh, utilize the missing persons graphic on our Facebook page and all of our social media to share as well. But this case really, her family, her sweet family really, really deserves justice in this. No more or no less than any other family who has a missing loved one who's likely, I mean, let's be honest, unfortunately, been murdered at the hands of their partner. But that's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Again, you're listening to We Saw the Devil. I'm Robin. This has been the case of Irene Gakwa, missing out of Gillette, Wyoming. For more information, please check the show notes or go to the website whereisirene.com. Until next crime.